Okay, so um, in our last class session, we wrapped up chapter six. So today we are going to be doing a partial uh, walkthrough of just a few key points from chapter seven that are relevant for um, general accounting knowledge. You'll cover chapter seven uh, in more depth in managerial accounting, but I wanted to talk about this today just uh, because knowing how to do certain cash transactions is, is important and also understanding the concept of internal controls. So with respect to your financial reporting and all of the accounting that gets done, um, we've talked about some different types of rules or principles that are associated with how you want to do your um, accounting, right? But all of those depend on making sure that what goes into your accounting system, whether it's paper system, whether it's a computer system, what have you, um, that everything that goes in there is information that is supposed to be there, right? And that it's correct. So in order to do that, you need to have what are called controls over your financial reporting system. Um, and they refer to those as internal controls because um, uh, they are internal within your organization. So you need to do things within your firm or your company that will ensure that your financial recording and reporting of your company's results um, are done accurately and that there is not fraud or theft going on, right? Um, so we're gonna talk about what some of those control procedures might look like and processes and um, just so you have a general understanding of that. So internal control in general is your plan, your organization-wide plan and all of the different things that you do within your organization in order to keep your assets safe, right? So keep people from stealing things, make sure they're properly tracked and kept, uh, um, the records are correct, um, things that you do to encourage employees to follow company policy, um, make your company operate efficiently, and uh, make sure that all of your in, uh, accounting records are accurate and reliable. <clears throat> and then, and a big part of this comes from how managers um, are setting up um, expectations for employees. So the four goals here, which I just said, safeguarding assets, encouraging employees to follow rules, um, operating efficiently, and then having accurate and reliable accounting records are all subjects to the internal control plan that you set up for your company. Now, um, there is a large national governing body called the Committee on Sponsoring Organizations, uh, also referred to as COSO. And they basically um, are a think tank that was created to um, develop best practices related to internal control and deterring fraud within companies. This was part of um, um, an act of Congress that came up in the early 2000s after there had been a series of frauds. And in particular, the, their number one concern is publicly traded companies, right? So our entire financial system, all of the stocks that get traded on the stock markets, the U.S. Treasury, um, Treasury bonds, all types of different investments and how money flows through our entire economy depends on people having trust in the flow of money, right? Um, what is your expectation if you take $1,000 to your bank and deposit it at the bank? That you'll be able to get the thousand dollars back. Yeah, that whenever you want to, you can go into that bank or using your debit card or whatever, you can get that thousand dollars out whenever you want. So that thousand dollars is yours. You have access to it and it's being kept safe. Our overall financial system operates the same way. Um, there is a little bit of risk associated with investing in the stock market maybe a lot of risk depending on what you're investing in. But the whole system relies on you being able to develop accurate expectations of the risk level, right? Um, 
So if people want to invest in stuff that's super safe, like U.S. Treasury securities, which have never defaulted, they can invest in those and make sure, and they'll know that they can get their money back out. If they're willing to take a little bit more risk, they could invest in a particular stock or a mutual fund. A mutual fund tends to be a little bit safer because it's a group of stocks that are all together. So like one company goes out of business, the mutual fund might drop in value, but you won't lose all your money. Highest risk level is associated with investing in individual stocks. We have to vary in price from anything um, from the company making money um, to going out of business to their uh, CEO getting on a radio show and saying something stupid that makes everybody dump their stuff, right? So a lot more risk associated with one individual company than with a group of companies. Um, and all of those companies that are traded on the stock market are referred to as public companies. So if you sell stock to the general public, you're considered um, a public company and you are legally required to have a system of internal controls in place to make sure that you have um, accurate financial reporting and safeguarding of assets. Okay. So believe it or not, it was 2002 before Congress actually passed an act saying, by the way, you guys have to have internal controls. <laughs> before that, it was just up to companies. The assumption was like, well, of course they would want to have good internal controls. But then we had a few massive, massive companies that went out of business due to um, um, improper and fraudulent financial reporting. And then Congress went, Maybe companies can't be trusted to govern themselves and there actually needs to be consequences if they are just making things up as they go along, right? So in 2002, they finally made some rules about that. And that was the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And that act did a few things, but one of the biggest things it did was require that companies have a system of internal controls in place over their financial reporting and that their... C-suite um, management people uh, take legal responsibility for making sure that those internal controls are working and over the financial reporting process. Because before that, they could just be like, well, the auditors are supposed to keep track of that stuff. I'm not a finance person. I'm a CEO. I don't have anything to do with the financial statements. So if they're wrong, blame that dude over there, right? That was totally what they would do. And so they wrote it into law you're the boss, you're responsible for the people who are underneath you, you're responsible for signing off on your financial statements that you're presenting to the public to get them to invest in your company. And if they're messed up, it is your fault. <laughs> so that's what the Sarbanes-Oxley Act did. And in addition to that, they required that companies actually have a an audit of their internal controls. Um, so they've always, they've for a very long time, they've had to have audits on their financial statements. Um, but an audit uh, of financial statements, like if you have an external auditor come in, they test some stuff and they look at how things are working, um, but they're not looking at everything. And um, all they can say is, well, we believe that the system works, but they can't say nobody has committed fraud. So they added, in addition to the financial statement audit, a separate audit of just the internal controls, where they come in and they test all the controls. They document all the controls that are supposed to be in place within the company to prevent fraud, to make sure financial reporting is accurate. Um, and then they issue an opinion saying, yeah, we believe the internal controls are working, or no, they don't think they're working. Okay. And then um, they also created the PCAOB, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board to oversee the auditors who are doing all of this auditing to make sure they're doing their jobs well. Because they're always trying to save money by doing less work, putting more trust in the companies, et cetera, or maybe not documenting things as well. And so by having somebody auditing the auditors, we have increased, theoretically increased the quality of the audits that are going on. Okay, so the rules that were in Sarbanes-Oxley, public companies have to issue up an internal controls report. So um, have an audit done on their internal controls. 
Um, they have to allow themselves to be overseen by the PCAOB as a provision of performing audits for public publicly traded companies. Also, accounting firms are not allowed to um, provide consulting services or non-audit services um, to their audit clients. Why do you think that might be that they can't say, I can't do like $8 million worth of consulting for you during the year and then also do your audit for like a million dollars at the end of the year? What would be a problem with that? It would be helping them like exploit loopholes and stuff and like hide, you know, fraudulent transactions or something. Maybe. Right. So the idea there is like, okay, if I make a million dollars auditing someone and reporting on whether they're doing things right, but I make $8 million telling them what to do the other 11 months out of the year, which one do you think I'm going to care about more? The 1 million or the 8 million? Probably the eight, right? They're going to be more worried about saying something in the audit that might ruffle the feathers of their clients than they would be uh, because they don't want to lose their $8 million consulting contract. That's how it was before Sarbanes-Oxley. And we had companies like Arthur Anderson. There used to be a big five. That was big four accounting firms. Um, Arthur Anderson, prior to 2002, um, was sort of like the heavy hitter and like the untouchables. Um, and they were doing so much consulting work for a company called Enron that if you walked into the financial reporting department and the accounting department at Enron and you walked down the middle aisle, um, even, even the um, Arthur Anderson employees didn't know which people worked there were Arthur Anderson employees and which ones were Enron employees. Um, because they were doing so much work there. They had people who literally were like seated at the clients working there full time year round doing consulting for them. And um, that's super problematic when they're making so much money that way um, that they would care more about the consulting work. It's also problematic because you're essentially auditing yourself. If you're doing that much work for a client, you're auditing your own work. You can't independently judge yourself. <laughs> right? Um, so, so that was a big change that happened. Um, and then any violators uh, of, Sarb of the rules of Sarbanes-Oxley, you could get 25 years in prison uh, for securities fraud. And um, if an executive swears that they have, um, that they are unaware of fraud or other things, and then they are found to be dishonest, they can get 20 years in prison. So important legislation. It's mostly related to public companies, but it's it's important to know about. Okay, so here we have um, a um, acronym that tells us about what are the elements of internal control, like what goes into your internal controls. All of the things that incorporated together make up your system of internal controls. And the, uh, the acronym is CRIME, C-R-I-M-E. So we have control procedures, so uh, risk assessment, information systems, monitoring of controls, and the overall environment, all right? Now, um, the internal controls within a large company are typically monitored to make sure they're working by internal auditors. So people who work for a company and their whole job is basically to go around and make sure everybody is following the internal control uh, procedures that are out there. Um, and then um, external auditors are people who work for a public accounting firm and the client pays the external auditor to come in and run tests on their systems and their financial statements and reporting and stuff um, so that they can issue a report that says, hey, yep, everything looks like it's being done right. We're good. You can trust the financial statements of XYZ company because we came in and looked at them and we didn't find anything amiss. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about what these um, components um, consist of one by one here. So for C, control procedures, 
Um, you have to have people who are competent, reliable, and ethical working there. So, so controls over hiring and who you hire are part of your control procedures, like maybe doing background checks or some places will do credit checks to make sure you don't have like major financial um, swords hanging over your head. Um, and then how you assign responsibilities to people is a really important control procedure. There's a concept called separation of duties, which basically says that the, say, the person who can authorize a transaction should not be the person who records it or the person who reconciles it or like checks it for errors after the fact, right? So those three things um, um, need to be separate or um, whoever has custody of the assets, like whoever physically has access to the inventory should not be the person who is doing the accounting for the inventory or the reconciliation, like or counting of the inventory, right? Why do you think you want to separate those things? Like, what would that do for you? So let's say I have the cash box, but I'm not allowed to, I'm not the person who's going to go and like count it at the end and make sure that all the money's there. What does having that separation do for us? Yeah. yeah most people Yeah, it's a deterrent, right? Like if I know that I'm gonna, if I've got this cash and I'm walking around with it, and let's say I'm like working uh, a till at a store, right? And I know that I'm gonna hand that to a manager and the manager's gonna count it at the end of my shift. Am I gonna be a little more careful about making sure all that cash stays in the cash box? If I know that it's gonna immediately be counted and someone's gonna be like, where's my $20, right? Um, so separating that, Otherwise, like if I was counting it myself, then I could falsify the records and be like, no, it was all there. If it's gone now, I don't know what happened to it, right? It just gives you deniability if you don't have that separation. Um, so separating operations and custody from accounting are the big things, right? Um, or the person who can record the transactions in the accounting system is not the person who checks at the end um, to make sure that they match up with what assets you have on hand. So like, let's say I record things in the checking account in the accounting system, somebody else is gonna look at the bank statements and make sure that the amounts that are going in and out of the bank statement match up with what I'm recording in the accounting records. Um, so that's separation of duties. And it helps limit fraud and it makes helps make sure that um, there's more accurate accounting records. Because if you're sure that all this all the money is there and you're sure everything is right, you're maybe not going to be as critical about checking it over at the end as if um, you're doing it for someone else. Okay, so um, audits, as I mentioned, internal audits are a control procedure as are external audits. So the internal processes are, I have a person who works in my company and their whole job is to um, look at things and make sure that they're correct. Right, You're, it, it's gonna increase your accuracy to have that. Having an external audit um, is also helpful because it's somebody who's independent of your company. So they're gonna come in and look at things with a little more skepticism and um, they're gonna be independent of the company itself. So they're not gonna like feel bad if they're bugging people about not doing their job or things like that. Um, maintaining documents um, and, and documentation of uh, things that are recorded is important. Um, and then um, using electronic devices to track things can be another control procedure. So like places that have tons of um, pallets of inventory might have RFID tags or other electronic inventory tracking mechanisms in place um, to count and keep track of inventory locations. Um, if you have e-commerce, so if you're selling stuff online, um, using encryption to send information back and forth is, is pretty standard. That's a standard control procedure. So if you're sell sending people's credit card numbers and banking information back and forth, it gets coded in such a way that somebody can't just like tap into a line and grab everybody's banking information. They need to have the key to unlock the information and decode it in order to read it. And now they use like 256-bit encryption, I think. So um, 
if you consider that like during World War II, this is, you know, obviously like 80 years ago, something is, yeah, 80 years ago, um, they had, they had physical machines that used five bit encryption, like five layers. And that was considered at the time to be unbreakable. Now we use, uh, with computers, we use 256 bit, sometimes more. Um, so coding stuff when you're transmitting it, encrypting it um, is a control procedure. So are firewalls like that basically prevent people from breaking into computer systems. So, and then we use things like pins, passwords, and whatnot um, to keep people out of stuff they don't belong in. Um, other controls you could have would be like having things stored in fireproof vaults, having alarms, um, making people take vacations so that somebody else can jump in and do their job is a huge way of preventing and detecting fraud and then rotating people between jobs and, and uh, duties. Okay, skip past that. Now, um, collusion happens when you have two or more people working together to get around the internal controls so that they can commit fraud or steal things. Um, that's a key term to know. Um, even the best systems of internal control can fail if you have multiple people with different sets of access working together to override the system. And then um, there's also a cost benefit aspect of internal controls. Um, Generally, if the benefit that you're going to receive from an internal control is less than what the cost would be to implement it, unless you're required to implement it for some reason, you would typically not um, implement that internal control. All right, so the general concepts related to internal controls. Um, you probably can answer problem uh, sample problem number one based on what we've just talked about so far. So look at that really quick. All right, so take a second and just recall those terms. Second. All right, let's see where everybody ended up here. So internal controls, that organizational plan um, to safeguard assets, encourage companies to employ uh, and follow policies, promote operational efficiency and ensure accurate and reliable counting records. And then employees of the business who ensure the company's employees are following the company policies would be internal auditors. Encryption, mathematical process for rearranging messages um, to achieve security in um, e-commerce. Sarbanes-Oxley Act requires companies to review their internal controls and then separation of duties is dividing things up between two people. All right, so um, talking about cash receipts, what are the internal controls that you might put in place specifically related to cash? Well, um, not all companies are cash heavy, right? Obviously, if they have a cash register, they're going to be more likely to have cash. Um, usually, cash receipts are happening in places where somebody's selling uh, merchandise or services like 
one-to-one -one with customers. And um, depending on how you receive your cash, you might have different measures, right? So if you're, if you're taking cash in with a cash register, which is over the counter, then you probably have some type of cash register point of sale uh, system that will track how much cash should be coming in and out. Because if you don't know how much cash should be coming in and out, um, you don't know how much you should have at the end, right? So what are, um, I'm sure somebody here has worked someplace with, probably multiple someone's have worked places with cash registers. What are, how does that work when you have a cash register? Like what are some things that happen associated with cash registers? Yeah. Dealing with money. Huh? Dealing with money. You're dealing with money, yep. So what do they do? Do they just sort of like hand you an empty register and then you start taking money from people or what happens at the beginning of your shift? Huh? Count the yeah, they give you a till that has a set amount of money in it, and you count it, right? So you make sure everybody agrees on how much money you started out with. And then what does the cash register do? Yeah, you enter in the sales, and then it records it, and it keeps track of subtotals of different types of cash receipts that you have. Um, what else does the cash register do? Can you just like swing the door open whenever you want and grab any more cash out of it? What do you have to do in order for it to open up? Transaction. Yeah, you have to enter a transaction and then hit like receipts and then it will open the till and you can put money in and take, get change and stuff, right? So it's not open unless you're actually recording a transaction. Um, so that's a control because you can't just go in there unless you're actually recording something. Okay, and then what happens at the end of your shift? You count the till again, and then what do you do after you count it? Yeah, so you give a list of what's in there. Um, usually what you do is you get something out of the till, though that will print off like a summary of your total sales, right? And and often it will tell you like how much cash you should have at the end. Um, not all places have you pull that up. Sometimes the manager pulls that up and then you come to independently. So you don't know if you have all your money. You just know what you had. Um, depends, different way, different places can do it different ways. Either way, the manager at some point ultimately is going to compare what you're supposed to have to what you actually have. And then they have cash over short. And like, what's a normal amount to have like over shorts? Let's say you're working someplace for like four or six hours, like. What's a what's an amount that would like not necessarily be people freaking out over on a till? Ten cents. Huh? Ten cents. Yeah, like change, maybe a dollar or two, right? If you're off by like twenty dollars, people are gonna freak out, right? Um. All right, so that that's uh, some different controls that you might have in place. So the counting, the physical access um, locked away. Um, what happens then if you receive your checks via mail service? Well, um, that gets a little more complicated, right? So how do you think you prevent someone from stealing money that is sent to you in the mail? Pay to the So that's a basic control. Like, so if you write out a check, you could send a check or a money order or something instead of cash. Um, that would be one way of doing it, being like, don't send, do not mail cash. You could say that. Um, what are some things that a company can do on their receiving end to um, ensure that when that when the mail comes in, that everything is uh, kept track of? So there's a couple ways you can do it. If you have it coming directly to your main mailbox, um, you probably want to have a locked mailbox if you're receiving a lot of money, right? So people can't just like you walking down the street and be like, oh, don't mind if I do and grab it out of there and walk off, right? So locked box. Um, you could have a separate mailbox for people to send money for their bills. Like when you send your money to Spectrum for your internet or whatever, or um, send in your power bill if you're if you mail it. Um, it doesn't just like go to the office downtown, right? Where do you, what kind of address do you often see on bills that you're paying? P.O. box. A P.O. box, right? A post office box. So they have like locked box systems. There are companies that will have like 
their own entire lockbox service where you send in your stuff and then they have like cameras on everybody who's opening everything. The people who work in there cannot bring bags and they can't have pockets. They can't have anything in their pockets when they go in around. They're under close scrutiny while they're opening things so that everything goes to where it needs to go. So using a lockbox system with uh, cameras to open the mail is a, is a huge control procedure. Okay. Um, and I'm probably not going to get through all of this. I may continue this on Monday, but, um, and then also you would fill out what's called a, like some type of remittance advice or a receipt, uh, every time you receive cash to keep track of every receipt that comes in. Now, um, once they have opened the mail, so a mailroom employee, um, who specifically their job is to open the mail. Um, collects all the checks together, fills out a remittance slip to track it. The treasurer is given um, the um, uh, cash to deposit at the bank. The cashier receives a deposit receipt. And then the accounting department um, uses the remittance advices to record the journal entries for the cash receipts. And then a separate employee compares the accounting records to the bank records to make sure that they match up, okay? All right, now when we're making payments, um, some of the controls we would put in place would be like, uh, you mentioned using checks to make payments. So they need to have a signature on them by somebody who's authorized on the account. And um, you typically would wanna have an invoice or some type of document to show you why you're writing out a check for something. Okay. Now, um, things that we can match up, um, and we talked about this, oh, sorry, different class. Um, documentation that you can use before writing out a check is to make sure like, okay, I had a purchase order that was issued in order to make this purchase. So we authorized this purchase. I received an invoice from the vendor. Um, oh my gosh, okay. I totally was like, had the wrong class time. And I was like, oh man, how did we go through an hour already? But we haven't, we've gone through 35 minutes. Okay, that makes me feel better. I was starting to freak out like about how much information I budgeted for today. Um, so when you make a purchase, you the purchase has to be authorized with a form called a purchase order. You send the purchase order out to the vendor that you want to buy from. They send you your stuff. They send you an invoice for the stuff. And then you have a receiving department at your company that will fill out a report saying, hey, I received some stuff. And when we make the payment, we should theoretically have all three of those documents available matched up, showing the same amounts and same stuff before we write out a check. Okay. And then as far as controls over that, the person who is receiving the orders does not have access to the purchase order or the uh, invoice when they receive it. So they need to just say, hey, this is what I received. These are the items. And then they log that. And then the person who receives the invoice says, okay, did we have a purchase order? Yes. And did we have a receiving report that we got the stuff? Yes. So we've now matched all three of those together and now we can pay for the stuff that we purchased. Okay. So these we don't really know. We're not going through this part. I should have pulled that slide out of there. Okay. So um, as far as other things that are related to um, your internal control systems. I'm just going to zip back really quick to that PRIME acronym and talk about what each of these means briefly before we go on to petty cash. So we talked a lot about control procedures. Um, part of what happens in order to have control procedures, you need to first assess risk and be like, okay, what areas of risk do we have? Do we receive a lot of cash? If we aren't receiving a lot of cash receipts in the mail, then maybe we don't need like a huge lockbox system, right? Um, or uh, maybe we don't need a cash register system if we are not selling retail to customers. Um, 
having an information system like a computerized accounting system is uh, a component of internal control or having some kind of system for gathering your information, even if it isn't computerized. Like where do we track all of our records? Where do we keep track of how much money we owe people, et cetera? Um, monitoring is basically like having systems in place that check to make sure things are right. So like comparing your bank statements to your accounting records would be part of a monitoring system to make sure that things are being recorded correctly. Um, and then having an internal audit function in your company where you test to make sure people are following their required procedures is another type of monitoring. And then um, the control environment is sort of like the tone at the top. Like what is the ethical tone within your company? Um, are you paying people adequately? Are you Do people get time off? Um, does management take internal controls and financial reporting seriously, or do they brush things off and call the accountants like bean counters who don't know what they're doing and things like that? Um, is there a respect for the need to have the internal control procedures? Um, that would be the overall environment or tone at the top. Okay. So uh, let's talk about problem number two in the in-class exercises. This just talks about some general um, um, information about cash received by mail. So who, who opens the mail and sends the checks to the treasurer? Employee. Yeah, mailroom employee. All right. Okay, and then who deposits the customer checks in the bank? Treasurer. Yeah, treasurer or cashier. So the so the mailroom opening, mailroom employee opens it, hands stuff off to the cashier. Um, and then um, who uses the receipts or remittance advices, as they refer to them here, to record journal entries? How about someone from the back of the room? Yeah, yep, the accounting employees. Um, and then um, who compares the bank deposit to the journal entry for the cash receipts? Well, we've already done three out of the four. Yeah, controller, yep. So um, the controller keeps track of making sure that things are properly reconciled. Okay, and then this question ties to um, cash controls over purchasing, right? So vendor ships inventory and what do they send back to the purchaser after they have shipped stuff to whoever's buying it? So vendor is the person selling this stuff. What do I receive um, after I have purchased something from someone? Yeah, an invoice. So that's the bill. They send me a bill. And then um, after approving all documents, a purchase, what do we send to a vendor? Like, so let's say I've gotten my, I've checked and I have my purchase order. I have my invoice and I have my receiving report. What am I then going to send out to the vendor? A check, yep, a payment. And then um, if I'm ordering merchandise inventory, what do I have to send to the vendor to tell them what I want? Purchase order. All right, and then last thing, um, the person who is receiving the goods is going to prepare what? Receiving report, yeah. All right. Okay, so the last topic then in, that we're going to talk about here is going to be um, petty cash transactions. So <clears throat> um, when you have a large company that has all of these internal controls and you've got all of this need for documents and stuff, what does that make you think as far as like speed and efficiency goes? You think that's a fast process? Probably not, right? <laughs> if 
you've got to gather up three documents that are coming from three different parts of your company and log them all together to make one payment. That's not going to be a speedy process. Um, but there are times when you are going to want to buy things in a hurry for convenience purposes, and you don't want to have to go through like an entire committee in order to do it, right? Um, so that's where the concept of petty cash comes in. Um, so petty cash is a small fund uh, or account that you can use to make purchases for smaller expenses that don't need to have like 800 approvals in order to spend them out, right? Um, um, typically, there will be a designated person who's in charge of keeping track of the petty cash, so a custodian. There will be a specific amount of cash that needs to stay in the fund, and it might be anywhere from like $500 to $2,000, or if it's a really large company, they might even have like a small separate checking account that has like $10,000 in it for petty cash, depending on how many small purchases they're making on a regular basis. It's going to vary widely from company to company. For a smaller company, it's probably more like 500 bucks or a thousand bucks. Um, and um, within that system, then there will be a way of um, keeping track of pre numbered, so sequentially numbered in order. Um, receipts or expenditures to track everything that goes in and out of the petty cash, right? Um, if you have a small company, they may very well just have like a carbon copy little booklet and a cash box that has 500 bucks in it in their office that they can use for like buying lunch or buying some quick office supplies if we run out of something. So um, to establish a petty cash account, um, all you do is you like you have a separate account on your uh, general ledger called petty cash. You would debit petty cash for the amount that you're putting in there and you're gonna credit your regular cash account. So um, you, and how that might actually occur in real life when you're recording that, you might have somebody who goes out and like cashes a check for $200, puts the cash into a cash box. And then we create this journal entry to debit petty cash and credit cash to track that that cash has been moved into petty cash. Now, um, next, you're going to make a bunch of expenditures, right? So uh, either in your accounting system or using like a petty cash booklet that has carbon copy receipts in it, um, you're going to you're going to keep track of payments that are made. So here. Uh, this company spent $60 to buy some um, office supplies. And um, we use what is called an impressed system for petty cash. And basically what that means is that we spend the petty cash down until we get to a certain point where we want to refill it. And then we pull cash out of our regular checking account to reimburse the petty cash for all of the um, cash expenditures that have been made. And it, essentially what that does is we always it, we always keep some petty cash on hand for whatever we need to spend. And we probably like once a month will reconcile the petty cash and replenish it or maybe more often if necessary. But ideally you'd have enough money in your petty cash that would last you like a month without needing to be refilled. So you're not constantly like running to the bank to get up more cash. So it sort of defeats the whole purpose of having the petty cash, right? Okay. Um, now, anytime we spend money out of the petty cash, then you know we want to have a system for replacing it so that we've always got cash on hand that we can use. Now, um, in our company, at the end of August, we had $118 left in cash. So we originally put in 200. At the end of the month, we had $118 left and we had $80 in petty cash tickets. So the cash that's left plus the receipts that we have, if we add them together, is only $198. So we're $2 short in our petty cash, okay? Um, but at any given point in time, in theory, the amount of cash that we physically have in our petty cash box and the total of the receipts that we have should add up to the expected fund balance. And if it doesn't, then we're uh, short of cash, or maybe we would even potentially end up over for some reason. So to replenish the ca petty cash at the end of the month, 
what we do is we debit expense accounts for all the little things that we bought. So we had a $60 office supply purchase. We had a $20 delivery expense purchase. And then we had a $2 in cash that was missing that we're gonna debit into cash over and short. And then we would credit our regular cash account for the $82 that they're going to put back into the petty cash account. So um, nothing hits an expense account during the month for petty cash. It hits the expense account when we reimburse um, and uh, replenish the petty cash account at the end of the month. And then we would um, hopefully end up, we'd start over the next month with the $200 again. Okay, now, um, when we so when we have cash missing or if for some reason we have excess cash, we would always um, put it in that cash short and over account or cash over short. And um, the only time we actually make a journal entry to the petty cash account itself, is when we are creating the count or if we're um, changing the overall balance that we expect to be in there. So once we've created our $200 petty cash account, unless we uh, close it completely or decide, you know what, $200 isn't enough, we're spending a lot, let's change this to 500, we might debit petty cash for an additional amount if we're going to permanently increase the balance in there. Um, but all the entries to record the expenses come out of the um, replenishment check that is written from our main checking account. Okay, so here's an example where we have a cash overage. Let's say we had cash on hand of $118 and we had petty cash receipts of $90. So when we add those together, it's $208 or $8 more than we should have. To make that entry, um, we would credit cash over short instead of debiting it. So basically, you're going to debit your expenses for the things that you bought. You're going to credit your main cash account for whatever amount you have to replenish. And then you can figure out if you have to debit or credit your cash over short account, depending on whichever will balance your journal entry. Okay. All right. Um, and then if we want to increase the petty cash fund, we would just debit petty cash and credit cash. So let's look at our problem number three here for the sample problems. Take a minute here now um, and uh, take a look at this. The first entry to establish the fund. I'm going to hit which two accounts? Yeah, just petty cash and cash. We debit the petty cash because it's an asset and we're increasing it. And we're going to credit cash. Whoops, there uh, we go. And then title is just gonna be to open the petty cash fund. Okay, and then to replenish it, we had $33 in cash and we had 306 in petty, petty cash tickets. So the 306 in petty cash tickets plus the 333 in cash. Um, gets us $339 total. We're supposed to have 350, right? So is this cash over or short? It's short, right? Short $11. All right, so then to make our entry to um, replenish this, we are going to debit which accounts? Yep, so the supplies, delivery expense, postage, and miscellaneous, yep. For the amounts that we had up here. And then um, 
Yep, cash over and short. Since we're short, it's going to be an expense. And then, um, yeah, we're going to credit our, or I'm sorry, we're going to, yeah, credit our regular cash account there for the, um, let's see, 339, no, or actually the 350, right? Or I'm sorry, sorry, 201, sorry, it's how much? How much do they cash? Oh, um, Eleven should we should have two twenty cash. So okay, here let me get a calculator here, right? So we're going to add up um, the amount that we're actually because what we have to write the checkout for is the amount that we need to um, get it up to um, three fifty, right? So if we have if we're supposed to have three fifty and we only have thirty three, then we have to put in three hundred seventeen to get it back up, right? So if we add up all of our columns there, to, um, our expenses, we had 201 plus 35 plus 59 plus 11 plus 11. That's the 317 that we would be reimbursing. <clears throat> okay, so that's to replenish. So you'll always know the amount to replenish by taking what am I supposed to have minus what actual cash do I have at the end, which in this case was the 33. Oh, you have different numbers? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, yep. It is similar too. So you probably have different numbers on here, I bet. So watch out for that. So put whatever numbers you have up here. So you'll need to add your cash to your petty cash to figure out what total you have, um, find the difference between that and what you're supposed to have, and that'll be your cash over short amount. Okay, so then the cash is back to the $350 balance and you're ready to start the next month. Uh, whoops, this is what I'm looking for. Okay, and that is it for what I wanted to go through for chapter seven, just some basics of how petty cash works and basics of controls over cash. So you know that going forward. Um, next week, we are going to um, start in on chapter eight, which will be on receivables. And hopefully we'll get that all wrapped up before break next week.